الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وخاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعنة الله الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين من ليلتنا هذه إلى قيام يوم الدين my respected elders, brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. The purpose for gathering here this evening is to commemorate the anniversary of the wafat and the shahada of Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra alayha salam. And on this occasion, I would like to first of all con convey my condolences to the Imam of our time. Definitely this is an occasion and these are the times when we know that the Imam of our time is grieved and his understanding and his perspective and his mourning is of a degree that for us is incomprehensible. And secondly to all the mu'mineen and all the lovers and the Shia of Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra, I would like to convey my condolences. I want to begin tonight by quoting a hadith that we have mentioned from Rasulullah as a way of giving us a reminder of our purpose in, gather, in these sort of gatherings and the purpose and why we're here. In one of the riwayat which is narrated in which he explains the reason for why Fatima alayha salam was given the name of Fatima. Fatima was a name that was chosen by Allah for the daughter of Rasulullah. And in this hadith, he says that the reason why Fatima was given the name of Fatima is because فَإِنَّهَا لِأَنَّ شِيَعَتَهَا فُطِمَتْ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأَعْدَاؤُهَا فُطِمَتْ عَنْ حُبِّهَا Fatima means to be taken away from, to be separated from. In this hadith, Rasulullah says the reason why she is called Fatima is because her Shia are taken away from the fire. And on the other hand, her enemies are those that are taken away from her love. Now this is something which is very profound. And it gives us a purpose for having these gatherings, which is that number one, we should be trying to aspire to have love of Sayyidah Fatima in our hearts. God forbid that we should arrive at that point when in our heart we find nothing but coldness and emptiness. Because sometimes the choices we make can create clouds in our heart and barriers and darknesses. And beyond that, we have to aspire to be those who are Shia of Fatima, those who understand the path that she had for us, she and the Ahlul Bayt, and then take that path amalan in their practice in the hope that they can be truly counted among her followers. We began last night an exploration of some of the names of Sayyidah Fatima as a way of understanding who she was given our limited capacity and of inshallah inspiring us in order to try to follow these and to try to aspire towards these names in our lives. Last night we covered the name of ar the one who is content, the one who is pleased. Tonight I want to cover another name and in order to motivate that I want to give an incident that's reported from the life of Sayyidah Fatima according to a hadith we're told that 
Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam was frequently visited by the angels. They would come to her and they would talk to her and they would address her saying, Ya Fatima, Inna Allah astafaki wa tahharaki wa astafaki ala nisa'il alameen. Ya Fatima, uqnuti li rabbiki, li rabbiki warka'i ma'ar raki'een. O oh Fatima, Allah has chosen you and purified you and chosen you among all the women of the worlds. O oh Fatima, supplicate to your Lord and prostrate with those who prostrate. According to the hadith, the angels would do this repeatedly and she would hear them talking to her. And at one point she asked them, she says that isn't it the case that Maryam alayha salam was Sayyidatun Nisa al alamin She wants to clarify that because that's what the Qur'an states about the matter. Now Fatima knows the answer to that, but this is a mark of her humility and a way for us to understand. She asks them and they respond to her that yes, Maryam alayha salam was Sayyidatun Nisa al alamin for her time. But you, O Fatima, are Sayyidatun Nisa al alamin for all times. And she would speak with them, and they would speak with her. One of the titles of Sayyida Fatima al-Zahra is that she is Al-Muhaddatha. Al-Muhaddatha is the one who is conversed with, the one who is spoken to. The word Muhaddath is a word which is something that is known to us as Shias because it is our belief that all of our A'imma alayhim was salam were muhaddathun, that all of them were spoken to by the angels. They did not receive wahi like Rasulullah, but they did receive communication from the angels. And the angels would inspire them and give them knowledge of the unseen and would become in communication with them. And that's why they were called muhaddath. Fatima alayha salam was not an imam. She was not a rasul. But when it comes to her spiritual ranks, she was somebody who ranks among the highest of all of humanity. And so this station of being a muhaddath was something that was, she was also included in as well too. Another incident that's reported is that Sayyidah Fatima salam would receive these angels. They would be clamoring in order to see her. And at one point, she tells her husband, Amir al-Mu'mineen, she says that I... I'm having these angels and they are telling me different things. Imam, Imam Ali Islam tells her that when that occurs, call me. And I will sit down with you with, and I will write it down. Whatever they say to you, you tell me and I will write it down. In the course of those days when this was taking place, she would be receiving the angels and he would be writing. And eventually this was compiled into a manuscript, into a book which is known as Mus'haf of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam Now those who speak of, out of ignorance and those who wish to, those who have ill intentions, sometimes they accuse the Shia. They say that you don't really believe in the Qur'an, you have something else which you refer to. When we go away, you take the Qur'ans down and you use a different book. Sometimes, you know, they really wanted to find this other book. So, you know, the stories that are told of they would, how they would sneak into the Shia Masajid and the Husayniyas, try to go through the bookshelves and see where do they put this book that they read instead of the Qur'an, na'udhu billah. But that is based on inaccurate information and malicious intentions. The book of Allah is the Qur'an. The Mus'haf of Fatima is a book of hadith. One of the sources of a hadith that we have, it, this particular book, however, is not in our possession. We don't have access to it. In Riwayat, we are told that it was a book that was passed along from Imam to Imam. And from time to time, the Aima alayhim salam would refer to that book to find answers to questions. What did it have in it? In one riwayah, the Imam says that, Laysa fiha halalun wa haraman. It was not a book 
of laws. It was not a book of practical ahkam. وَلَكِنْ عِلْمَ مَا يَكُونَ but it is a book in which there was knowledge of that which is to come. Knowledge of the hawadith, knowledge of the events that will transpire. Knowledge of different rulers, the, the tughat, the tyrant rulers, the just rulers. All that is captured and part of the ilm that was given and deposited with Sayyidah Fatima. And that book lies with the imam of our time right now. So this is yet another incident that indicates to us that Sayyidah Fatima والسلام, was a muhaddatha, one to whom the angels spoke. Now before we go on and see how we can take this and apply it practically to our lives, because our purpose here is also to further our ma'rif, or further our understanding, I want to mention a few words about angels themselves. Normally when you think about angels, what comes to mind is what we've been fed through media, images of white creatures with light and wings that fly in the air. You know, beings are kind of like the opposite of the devil that they show us. The devil has the pitchfork and the red sort of thing, the angel is the white. But when you look at the Quran and we look at the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt والسلام, regarding the angels, we see that the reality is something other than that. Allah tells us in the Quran that angels, there are angels, who, Allah is the creator of the angels. They possess wings. Some of them have two wings, some of them have three wings, and some of them have four wings. Now, one thing that we should know about the Qur'an as a reminder is that when Allah uses words in the Qur'an and descriptions and nouns, we shouldn't just take the material meaning that we know of that word and try to understand the verse accordingly. For example, when Allah says, وَسِعَ كُرْسِيُّهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ that His throne encompasses the entire heavens and the earth, we know that what's being described is not a physical throne. It's not the case, na'udhu billah, that Allah is sitting on this great, magnificent throne that is a big throne. But rather, it refers to the knowledge of Allah which encompasses every single thing that transpires in His creation. Similarly, when it comes to ajniha, the wings of an angel, the mufassireen, like Allah Matawatawai, rahmatullahi point out that don't take the first meaning that comes to your mind. What is a wing? A wing is used as a means of transporting from low to high. This world and this universe, the creation of Allah, consists of different levels. Here we are in the lowest level of His creation. But there are higher levels as well too, all the way to the throne and to the kursi, the arsh. The angels are those means by which the communication takes place and the orders are sent down. Allah Ta'ala has chosen to create in a way that all of His orders are enacted by angels. These angels are not beings who are physical in nature, but rather immaterial beings. When you go to the riwayat of the, and the du'as of the Ahlul Bayt, we're told that everything that takes place in this universe is with the command of Allah, and along with it, there's an angel who executes it. Every raindrop that fa falls from the sky, an angel accompanies that raindrop. Every time we, every moment that we exist, we have angels that protect us. Four angels according to the Quran, that are with every human being and according to Ruwaya, that those angels are commissioned to be with every single human being until the time they die and then the angels will go away. Unfortunately, the perspective of somebody who is a materialist, somebody who is an atheist, somebody who leads a life devoid of spirituality is different. They don't see these things. They don't have any inclination. They think that it's just the human being and other human beings and animals and plants and so on and so forth. But when we look at the reality of the spiritual universe that Allah describes us in the Qur'an, it's something else. 
Now these angels are beings that are with us, they surround us, they're involved with everything that takes place. Allah could have created the world and could have done things directly, but He decides to do it through the wasata, through the means of these angels. And there are those who are able to perceive this. There are those who reach that point where they begin to communicate with the angels. Just like the angels are in different ranks, human beings are in different ranks as well too. We have a riwayah from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. <clears throat> in which he says that every time it comes in the morning time, there is an angel that comes to the human being and wakes that human being up. And there are those who will listen to that angel and wake up as a result, and there are those who won't. In one of his books, Marhum Jawad Maliki Tabrizi, one of the great ulama, he quotes this hadith and then he makes a comment afterwards. He says that when you hear these ahadith, don't be somebody who doubts them. Don't just disregard them. If you don't understand, don't be in a state of doubt and denial. Because there are some people who have heard the angels come to them and speak to them and wake them up in the morning. And in the language, in the Persian language, they say, and then he quotes it in Persian, Agha Pashu. It means, Sir, wake up. Now, some of the ulama have said that he's speaking about himself here. He doesn't want to say it. Maybe he's speaking about himself that he himself has heard this as well too. That the angels come and they wake us up. It's up to us to see whether we're going to wake up or not. But it is something which is there, something which is done. We have other ulama as well too who report about angels. It's something which is an experience that those who have purity, they are able to hear and sometimes able to communicate with the angels. Now, what I'd like to look at is this question, which is that how is this relevant for us? I would like to quote to you a hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. <clears throat> where Imam Ali alayhi salam speaks about the way to reach the angels. He says that on one hand you can take somebody who is a mujahid fi sabilillah and a shaheed. Now somebody who is at the front ranks championing the cause of truth, fighting against the enemy, and they give their life for that cause, that person definitely is deserving of a reward from Allah. Okay, he says that on, that's on one hand. On the other hand, he says that if you take the reward of that person, and you compare it to this other person, then you'll see that that other person doesn't have less of a reward. Now, who's this other person? He says somebody who has the ability to sin, but that person instead does ifa, they stay away from that sin. And then he says, Yakadul Afif, one who is Afif, one who is chaste, one who controls themselves from sinning, especially the sin of shahwa, the sin of lust, that person is as if they will be an angel among the angels. In this beautiful hadith, Imam Ali gives us a simple formula. He says that if you want to become one who is with the angels, one who has access to the angelic world, then there's a way to do it, which is the way of iffa, the way of controlling oneself when presented with the opportunity to sin, to resist doing so. Until you earn the title of being afif, one who is chaste, one who takes care not to engage in sin, especially the sin of the shahwa, at that point they will have access to this angelic realm. But this is something which is a reminder for us on this night as we remember Sayyidina Fatima alayhi salam, we remember the task that we have been given of trying to be her Shia. It's a task, it requires effort, it requires work. We realize and understand and remind ourselves that there's a path that needs to be taken. A path of ifa, a path of chastity. However, when we look at our situation right now, and we 
look in particular at the challenges that we are facing. One of the areas which is directly coming in conflict with our being able to achieve this goal is the presence of the media. In particular, I'm talking about media in, in the form of entertainment that many of our youth and many of us also have access to on a regular basis. What is the relation of this with the topic of Sayyidah Fatima alayhi Again, that we have come here to understand what it means to be a Shia and a Shia is one who has ifa, that is the path to earning this title of muhaddath, one who the angels come and speak with. One of the things that really is troubling me personally, I have the opportunity, alhamdulillah, to be able to be with youth and work with youth and work with children. On, on one hand, I'm very happy and very pleased to see the status and where many of our youth are. Truly, it's an inspiration for me and for my family, and I learn from them. But when I look at the threats that are looming, one of the things that particularly worries me is the presence of media and devices and the access that our young generation has to this and what effects it's having on them. In order to make this discussion a little bit more concrete, I want to just quote a few statistics, just a few. I'm not just talking in the air, but actually give some practical understanding of what's happening here. And these statistics, I want to apologize if somebody might find them offensive on a night like this. But because of the importance of this matter, I felt that I must take this opportunity to present these to you. This is a statistic, statistics which perhaps many of us are unaware about. And it's regarding the access to inappropriate pornographic content on devices through media. Back in 2008, they did a study of teenage boys. And they wanted to see how many of them are regularly accessing this type of material through internet, through devices. That was in 2008. How many years ago? Eight years ago. What they found was that in one of the West, in, in, in the UK, and the situation here is you know, not too much different than there, more than a quarter of teenage boys aged 14 to 17 were found to be accessing it every single week. So once a week, more than a quarter of boys 14 to 17. That was when? In 2008. Now just recently, this was uh, an article that was published again from the United Kingdom. Just about a month ago, this article was published. They redid the statistics on this. Back then, it was one out of four, more than a quarter. Recently, they redid the numbers. What was the numbers? It was more than four out of five regularly have access to pornographic material from the same age group. So when from where? From one out of four to four out of five. That's statistic number one. Statistic number two is that when they did a survey in North America of who is of, of children and how much access they have to this material, how many percent children ages 8 to 16 had access to this type of material? 90%. 90% of them have access to this type of material. 90%, 9 out of every 10. Now, when I give you these numbers, 4 out of 5, 9 out of 10, sometimes we have this feeling that we're talking about others. We're talking about people other than Muslims. We're talking about people other than the Shia of the Ahlul Bayt And I wish we were. I really wish we were. But the reality on the ground is something else. When you spend time with the youth, you come to understand what is the reality that they're facing. These devices which they are given, these devices which they are gifted, and they are given unrestricted access to what is it leading them towards. This is just one of the many dimensions. I was looking at another statistic, another study, where they were talking about the effect of watching images on women. Okay, they did a, one, a very interesting study. It was very cleverly done. They had a group of girls that they first evaluate, evaluated to see what is the level of their self-esteem. How, how good did they feel about themselves? Then they showed, these, they split these girl, girls up into different groups. 
they showed one group a series of music videos in which there was presented images of slim female bodies. So they were looking at these images and they watched a few videos. Other groups, they showed them different things. And after they did this experiment, they were able to show that just by being exposed to these type of images, it was something that, you know, uh, ladies looking at ladies, not something which is, you might think is harmful or haram, just by looking at it, they were able to prove statistically that their self-esteem had dropped. They stopped having that confidence in their own looks. And one of the problems that we're facing even now, right now, it's something which is becoming an issue, is the problem of body image. That people aren't happy with the way they look. Why? Because of the media that they're being exposed to. But this is something which is very serious, my brothers and sisters. When we speak to the youth, we speak to the children, it's something where it's almost as if it's a mark on their forehead. Who is it that has access to the media and who is it that doesn't? Who is it that watches and watches and consumes and consumes and who is it that doesn't? I want to tell you a, a story here and even though there's a lesson behind this story. Just take the story, inshallah, we can learn from it. They, they say that there was a group of, of Shias who weren't very well educated. And there was a group of Christian missionaries who came along and they said that, okay, we are going to take these people. They're simple. They're, they're not very educated. We're going to convert them to our religion. So they came along and you know, they started to treat them really well. They started to feed them and clothe them and you know, give them everything. And slowly, slowly, they started to tell them the story of Christianity. And one day, they've gathered them for a great feast. And then they want to tell them the whole story. So they get to the point where they tell them about you know, the, how Nabi Isa, السلام, according to them, had sacrificed everything. And they told the story. And they were waiting now for them to become Christian. And suddenly, as soon as they finish the story, they hear a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Why? Because they're Shias. Because you can do a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali They had been trying all this time to get that thing out of them, feeding them, clothing them. But there's one thing they couldn't rip away from them, which was their salawat. And they realized that this is hopeless. We're just going to go home. They're going to be Shia. That's how they found Shia at that time. And that's the way Shias are supposed to be. Not that they get tempted by these sort of things, but the idea that the faith is so deeply rooted that no matter what you go, you can move mountains, but you can't move the faith of a Shia of the Ahlul Bayt. But unfortunately, and this is the message I want to convey tonight, when we look at the situation on the ground, we see that unfortunately the opposite is the case. You can be talking about Ahlul Bayt, you can be talking about Taqwa, you can be talking about Ifa and all these beautiful concepts and beautiful stories. But when the heart is obsessed with the latest TV shows and the latest music videos and the latest bands and the iPods and the, and, and the iPhones, then no matter what you say, it's not going to have an effect. You know, when it comes to violent weapons, our society has an understanding that these things need to be kept away from children. They have laws in place, gun control laws. You can't just go and get a gun. You know, in, in, in the United States, it seems like they haven't figured this out yet. <laughs> uh, just uh, in the news just a couple of days ago, you might have seen that there was a lady who herself you know, was very proud of this idea of the right of being able to own an arm and have it at home as well too. She had even appeared in commercials you know, touting this ability that I have my daughter and I want to be able to protect her. And so I have a gun at home. In case anybody were to come, I'd be able to take that gun and shoot them. And guess what happened just a few days ago? That gun was loaded and on the table, her daughter took the gun and she shot her own mom. Why? Because that's what happens when you have a loaded weapon at home. It's not safe. You have to have laws around that thing. You have to control it. It's dangerous. Now, if that's the case when it comes to the body, then isn't it more important that we protect our souls? This same device that we have, when we leave it, unrestricted, unprotected, do with it whatever you want, any time that you want. What do we think the result is going to be on the soul? Are we going to be able to create children and have our children and ourselves be among those who take this path of the muhaddatha? The path of those who had purity, the path of those who were able to have the angels come in 
speak with them? Don't think that this path is just something that was for the Ahlul Bayt and we are just to gather around, talk about it, and then that's it. No, this was our, our path as well too. In hadith we're told that Imam Sadiq alayhi <laughs> salam that he used to always talk about Salman, Salman al-Farisi. And he would tell people, don't call him Salman al-Farisi. He was Salman al-Muhammadi. He was somebody, he would frequently mention him. They would ask him and they would say, why do you talk about him so much? And then he would mention the merits of Salman. One day a man comes to him and he says that, oh, yeah, Imam, I've heard that they are saying that Salman was a muhaddath. That he was somebody that the angels used to come to. And the Imam Ali tells him calmly, yes, he had a special angel, a malakun kareem, a noble angel who was with him at all times. And that man is just astounded. And he says that, well, if that's the case, then what about his sahib? What about his, his master, meaning Rasulullah? What about, what is his status? And Imam Ali says that you go along your own way. You won't be able to understand these type of realities. One day Salman, <coughs> was walking along the streets and he meets this one man who is he comes across this crowd of people they've gathered around this one man who's fallen to the ground and they're worried about him they say that something's wrong with him he's fallen ill so they see Salman they say go see if you can do something here he bends near to that man and the man whispers to him he says that these people don't understand Salman I know who you are you can understand me I've heard this verse of the Qur'an وَلَهُمْ مَقَامِعُ مِنْ حَدِيدٍ They will have hammers of iron regarding the, you know, the, the, the angels who are in charge of the fire of hell. One of the punishments is the, 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 um, the, the mallets of, of hadid, of iron, they will be striking with. And when I heard that verse, it affected me so much that I fell down to the ground. And that's my situation right here. Salman radiallahu an says that at that point I realized I found a friend and they became friends in the sake of Allah. There were people like this who used to live. There are people like this who still live right now. Later on, we're told in that hadith that that friend of his fell ill. He goes to see him. And as his death nears, his friend tells him that, Salman, I want you to do something for me. When the angel of death comes, I want you to tell him to take it easy on me. And the hadith continues and says that when Malikul Maut came, Salman addressed him. Because these mysteries that are mysteries for us weren't mysteries for Salman. He could see the angel of death and talk to him. And he tells him that, O oh, angel of death, this is my friend. Have mercy on him. Be kind to him. And Malikul Maut says that I am merciful and gentle to all the mu'mineen. And with that, he takes the life of his friend. This path is a path which is open to the non-ma'asumin as well too. But the only way we're going to have access to it is by taking the path of ifa, of understanding what is it that's preventing and cutting us off from it and addressing those issues. And the main issue right now that we see is with the media, inshallah, with the inspiration that we seek from Sayyidah Fatima Azhar Hadisan, we can revise and renew our policy towards the media. Sadu Anna Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <laughs> Tonight we have gathered for the Masaib of Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. And as we recount these incidents, I invite you all to see if you can bring tears to your eyes. Inshallah, these tears will be sources of shifa and spiritual healing and something that we can use to our credit, inshallah, on the Day of Judgment. According to a riwayah, we're told that there was one time when our Imam, Imam as sadiq alayhi salam, was speaking to one of his companions about the masaib that the Ahlul Bayt have had to face. He tells him that our tra tragedies have been many and we have faced many difficulties. His companion tells him that, yes, that's the case, but there will be a day when revenge will be taken. 
And the Imam alayhi salam begins to cry and weep. And he tells him that yes, that's the case, but how difficult was these days that we had to face? There was the day of Karbala. And we know that the day of Karbala was a day La yawma ka yawmika aba Abdullah. It was a day unlike others. Nothing can compare, compare to that tragedy. But in this riwayah, Imam As-Sadiq says that even though we had the day of Ashura, even though we had what transpired in Karbala, there was another day. There was another day which was A'adham and Amar. There was another day which was even greater and even more bitter. From what perspective and why? Which day was this? He says that was the day of Saqifah. That was the day where they took to the door of Amir al-Mu'mineen and Fatima and Hassan and Hussein and Zainab and Umm Kulthum and Fidda. That was the day of Qatli Muhassin. It was the day of the killing of Muhassin as well too. Muhassin is, is probably known. Now how can that be? Why is that Imam salam is saying that that day was more bitter? Of course we know there's no day like the day of Karbala. One of the senior ulama, he explains perhaps one of the reasons for why might that be the case. Because let us now go to the day of Ashura when Imam Hussein alayhi salam is fighting on the battlefield, salamu alayhi alayhi. They have taken Abbas alayhi salam and they have killed him. Imam Hussein alayhi salam is alone against an army of 30,000 men. He fights them on one-on-one -on -one combat, one after the other after the other, and he defeats them. But after all, in that sun and with that thirst, how much can one man do? At one point, Umar ibn Sa'ad, he urges the army. He says that go and attack him. Don't you know who this is? He is the son of Ali. It's not going to be easy. You're going to have to give it everything that you have. And they begin to fire arrow after arrow. They say that 4,000 arrows were shot at Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And at that point, a man can only face so much. He starts to kneel down to the ground. The enemy seizes the opportunity. And they start to go to the tents. They start to go to the tents of the family. Imam Hussein alayhi salam yells out to them, Ya Shi'ata Ali Abi Sufyan. O, o the followers of Abi Sufyan, if you don't have any deen, then at least be free, free, free people. These are the women folk. As long as I am alive, then leave them alone. Do not harm them. They have done nothing to you. And they say that to this one request of the Imam alayhi salam, they accepted they accepted this. Imam Hussein alayhi salam in his life never had to see in front of his own eyes the enemy coming and entering into the, the tents of his women folk. This was a tragedy that he was spared. He had to face every other single tragedy, but this particular tragedy in his life, he was spared. But when it comes to Amir al Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, on that day, this was a tragedy that he was not spared. There's an order that comes. And they tell the man, the man orders that go to the home and take the allegiance of Ali. And if he refuses, then even if it takes, it means burning down the house, then go and do so. They come to the door. They make their threats. Qunfud, the cousin of that one man, is told and given clear orders that if they resist, then this is your task. You take that whip and you strike with that whip. And according to Riwayat, he doesn't hold back from doing so. According to the Riwayat that are mentioned by Shaykh Abbas Qummi in Baytul Ahzan, a number of them, numerous Riwayat. And this is something which is well accepted among the ulama of the Shia. That what takes place on that day is something which is un unimaginable. The tragedy and the horror and the dhulm that happens to the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam. According to Riwayat, Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam, when they realize, when she realizes they want to burn down her house, she goes and to open up the door, but she doesn't want the non-mahram men to see her, so she takes refuge behind the door and the wall. But they, they lay an assault on the home. They come inside, they grab the collar of Imam Ali alayhi salam, and they begin to drag him to the masjid. 
When Fatima alayha salam sees this, she comes and she stands in their way and she says, by Allah, I will not let you take my cousin to the masjid in this way. How soon after the death of Rasulullah are you doing this and how are you are oppressing him? When Rasulullah had told you, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ أَجْنِ إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى But the narrator says that when that one man heard this, he ordered his companions to stay there. He says to Qunfud, take your whip and strike her. He hits her back with and side with the whip and with so much force that that child in her womb expires. They then take Imam Ali alayhi salam to the masjid and they make him stand in front of the Khalifa. Fatima alayhi salam comes to the masjid and she doesn't know whom to turn to. What can she do? She's just a woman against all these, these men or these so-called men. So she turns to the grave of her father. She turns to Rasulullah. Oh my father, this is what they are doing after your separation. This is what they are doing to Ali alayhi salam. This is what they are doing to the father of your grandsons, Hassan and Hussein. Oh my father, Ali is being dragged and arrested to the, similar to the way that they treat a camel. Fatima alayhi salam is, is crying out, Wa Muhammada, Wa Abata, Wa Abal Qasim. And then she swoons and she falls to the ground. Imam Ali alayhi salam, according to Ruayat, he would always remember the tragedy that they inflicted upon his beloved Sayyida Fatima. At one moment, he, at one time in history, later on, they say that when he was asked about Qunfud, he says that, do you know why? That even though they reduced the pension from the treasury of everyone, but they didn't re reduce the pension of Qunfud, it's because he was the one who had taken that whip and he was the one who took that whip and struck her with it. And those marks that were there stayed with her until the very end. Allah la'anatullahi ala al-qawm al-zalimeen wa sayya'alamu al-lazina zalamu ayyaman qalabin yanqalabin.